Okay, hi. So um, I am here to talk through the fixative effect and fixatives in gin. I'm not quite sure I'm going to answer the hit or myth question that's on the board in front of you, but it is um, an idea of which I've been very interested in where the origins of the idea came from. I'm pretty sure that those of you in the audience who either own a gin, represent a gin, work in gin, have at some point in your career uttered the immortal words, Angelica slash Oris is added to the gin to act as a fixative. Alternatively, Angelica or Oris help marry or bind the flavours of the gin together. But what does this actually mean? Now, when I was looking at this, I have to say that all the research that I could access that is out there um, on, on the internet um, comes from the perfume industry. But I am going to try and relate it back to gin as much as I possibly can because of the two products, they use very, very similar botanicals. I also had some very analytical uh, experiments set up that in my dream world I would have been able to run for you and present the results. Unfortunately, I don't own a GCMS and um, I also couldn't find a very friendly chemist. So uh, I'm just going to talk a bit through uh, what the fixative effect is, how it might work, and also what fixatives are, are there out there that we can use as distillers in our gin. Like any good researcher, I started uh, looking into this by Googling the word fixative and seeing what Wikipedia had to say about it. <laughs> and Wikipedia states that a fixative is used to equalize the vapor pressures and thus the volatilities of the raw materials in a perfume oil, as well as to increase the tenacity. So it's saying here that there are two concepts that, and two related concepts that are affected by fixatives, volatility and tenacity. And just so that we're all on the same page and we all know what we're talking about, I'm going to define them on the next couple of slides. Volatility. As I'm sure you're all aware, volatility is the tendency of a substance to vaporize. That's not unusual. It's uh, di directly related to the vapor pressure and indirectly related to the boiling point. That means that the higher the volatility, the higher the vapor pressure, the lower the boiling point. So if we're thinking about this in terms of gin, Volatiles are those that are coming across at the beginning of your distillation run. They're the ones with the lowest boiling points. And if you run your eyes down um, all the lists of the aroma, the aroma compounds that are in a gin and look at their boiling points, the ones that are lowest are those from citrus and juniper. So they're the ones, the top notes, they're the ones that we're looking at losing first from a gin. Tenacity is described as the lasting effect of a character or flavor nuance. Tenacious materials are um, those that fill up the middle and base notes of your overall flavor profile. They have relatively high boiling points. They come off later in the distillation run. And by definition, top notes cannot be tenacious. So that's very well and good. And I think that we're all quite um, happy with the concept of the fact that fixatives are going to be helping those top volatiles, those top notes, those uh, citrus, juniper, they're going to be working to depress the volatility of these compounds. But one of the things I thought was interesting about that definition was they included tenacious or tenacity as a separate entity. So is there something else that's going on that's not solely related to volatility? And that was something I was having a little bit of a look at. I'm going to start with the volatility effect first and try and explain to you how these um, compounds, these fixatives work or could potentially work to depress this volatility. I have to be really careful. Um, there are a lot of great books on the market that you can go out and buy that discuss individual gin botanicals um, and talk about their properties, their aroma, how you can use them, um, what they're good for. And most of them mention the idea of this fixative effect in association with Angelica and Oris. None of them, or very few of them, talk about the mechanism of action. However, in the last couple of years, I've seen a couple of books, there's two or three of them out there, that are trying to do this. And that's great, but they're using a very similar sounding sentence. And that sentence is, fixatives work by holding other flavors and fragrances in place. Now, we're all quite, quite happy with that. That's, that's a great statement. By contributing a missing atom that would otherwise make the fragrance volatile. This doesn't make any sense. This is incorrect. Over the next couple of slides, I'm going to try and explain on very simplified model what could be happens, happening scientifically um, 
when you add a fixative to a solution. And I can assure you I'm not going to be mentioning missing atoms. When you open a bottle of gin, you can smell it. You can smell the flavours, the top notes, those citrus juniper notes. That is telling you that there is a spontaneous evaporation of very volatile compounds from your gin. And it's this, it is this evaporation that we're looking to hinder in order to um, secure the longevity of our products, to stop that happening. So fixatives must be working when we add it into a gin to hinder this evaporation. <coughs> Let's try and explain how that happens. This equation is one that most science students in the room should recognize. Um, it's one that you come back to time and time again when trying to explain why a spontaneous process occurs on a molecular level. It's delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. I don't want you to worry too much about the origins of the equation, but I'm going to use it as almost like a kind of scaffold for my explanation here. Ooh, where am I going? Okay. So let's start with G. What is G? So G is the Gibbs free energy of a system. Don't worry about it too much. When um, a spontaneous process occurs, the Gibbs free energy in the system is decreased. Okay, so delta G, or the change in G, is negative, and it must be negative for a spontaneous process to occur. This doesn't give you any kind of indication of how quickly the process will occur, the rate at which it will occur. It just states that in the absence of any other forces, that spontaneous process will happen. So, if we add fixatives to a system, we're looking for them to make this side of the equation, so delta H minus T delta S, more positive, so less negative, because we're trying to hinder that spontaneous process. So if you look at this equation, we're looking to make delta H more positive and larger, and delta S and delta T, <coughs> sorry, not delta T, T delta S, smaller overall, okay? Let's take each of those turn, um, letters in turn and think about how fixatives might affect them. T is the temperature of the system. It is completely independent of your fixative. OK, um, obviously, if you stick a gin in a baking hot room, you are increasing the value of T. You're increasing the value of T delta S overall. You're making delta G more negative. Evaporation is more likely to occur. So we can ignore T for the sakes of our arguments today. And let's just look at H and S. <laughs> and we're going to start with H. So H is enthalpy. It's the energy that is available, energy of the system, sorry. Um, and delta H is either the energy that is required to be put into a system when a process occurs, or the energy that is given out when a, a process occurs. And in the case of evaporation, that has to be energy put into the system, OK? Um, so we're looking to make delta H, the change in the entropy, en enthalpy, sorry, um, the change in the enthalpy uh, more positive and larger. So we're trying to increase the amount of energy that is required for evaporation to, to occur, for these volatiles to escape the system. How would fixatives do this? The known fixatives that are out there in the, in the perfume world and in the chemistry world um, are large non-volatile molecules. They have high boiling points. So if we think about them mixing with volatile compounds, what happens is they form intermolecular um, interactions. They're weak, but they're kind of they're bonds that are called van der Waals bonds. They're there, they're weak, but they're not very strong, but they're definitely there. If we think about two different beakers of gin, one of which, and I'm really sorry, by the way, these slides were mu looked much better on my laptop, but my font was different, and I'm quite distressed. It was a very nice font, and uh, it's, it's all over the place. Anyway, um, I'm going to hope it, hope it stays readable. Uh, so in the first gin, which is the fixative free gin, the volatiles are free to leave. They're just free to leave solution as and when they will under this spontaneous process. However, the volatiles in a fixative gin have these very weak van der Waals forces between the non-volatile molecules and the volatile molecules. So immediately we can see that we need to put N more energy into the system, into the second system, to break these bonds before the volatiles can escape. 
So just by the presence of these van der Waals, these weak van der Waals forces, we know that we have to have a greater energy contribution before evaporation can occur. We've made delta H larger and more positive, which is what we were trying to do. Let's look at S. And this one's got quite a few pictures on, so this one's one that might get a bit haphazard. Let's see. Um, S is entropy. So it's the measure of disorder in a system. And according to the second law of thermodynamics, um, entropy in a system is moved to increase. So you're looking to make delta S positive when you have a spontaneous system. What does this, what does this mean? I mean, what does disorder mean when you're thinking about a system? A gas is considered more disordered than a liquid. And a liquid with just ethanol and water in it is considered less disordered than ethanol, water, and lots of other organic compounds like we have in gin. Let's think about a single botanical gin. And I've made it really simple by saying the only thing you get from juniper is pinene. And we heard earlier that that's definitely not the case. But in a single botanical gin, on a simplified model, you have ethanol, pinene, and water. On evaporation, the pinene moves to escape the liquid, and you end up with I've lost my, there we go. Uh, gaseous pinene. A gas is more disordered. There's a gain in entropy. It's favored, and delta S is positive. However, if we consider that we start with not just a single botanical gym, but we put something like Angelica in there, we've got ethanol, pinene, water, and a fixative. This gin is considered more disordered on a thermodynamic level than the single botanical gin. When pinene evaporates, you get gaseous pinene. That's great. That's still a favorable entropy contribution, but the gain in entropy is smaller because you started from a more disordered system. So although delta S is still positive, it's a smaller positive value. Let's take this back to the original equation. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. T is, oh, this slide's gonna screw up. Um, T is unaffected by the presence of fixatives. Definitely. Delta H is increased by the presence of fixatives. It's made more positive. And delta S, which is off the bottom here, I hope, there you go, is decreased by the presence of a fixative. So we've got a smaller, T is constant, delta S is smaller, this is smaller overall, and this is increased and become more positive. Delta G is more positive, we've hindered evaporation. Okay. Don't worry too much if you didn't follow that. It's a very simplified model, but it's definitely not involving missing atoms. That's kind of the missing, the, the point I wanted to get over. Um, but can we see this in the gin we make? And that's the important point, right? At Jensen's, which is the gin I make, um, we actually make two. Uh, I make a Bermondsey Dry Gin and an Old Tom. And when we talk about these gins to consumers, often uh, a line that comes out of our mouths when we're talking about the Old Tom is that it's very much more restrained on the nose. It's very much more um, closed as a gin. And if you look at the percentage botanical makeup of the two gins, they both have less than 1% oris in them. But the old Tom has significantly more angelica. So what I thought it would be nice to do is to make up a sample of the old Tom, but with a lot less angelica in it. And that's your sample one and two on your boards that you should have in front of you. I want you to nose these to begin with and think about that evaporation rate. Now, I, I really want your opinion here. I want you to think whether, and please don't judge the second gin as a balanced gin, or the first either, because I'll be quite offended if you don't think it is. Um, but the second gin, don't judge it as a balanced gin. I've just dropped the angelica down. I just want you to think about whether you're getting some of those aroma compounds or less of the aroma compounds, or are more of the citrus notes coming through than the first one? And just give me a bit of feedback. I'd be interested to know. Or if you can't tell the difference, that's also fine. I also realize they're very small samples. I didn't bring enough. You can taste them as well. It's a lot less complex, but are you smelling more citrus? <coughs> On the first one. See, this is what I'm, what I'm trying to obviously, because if we're talking about a fixative effect, is it that the citrus was there, but it's vanished now <laughs> because I took away the fixative? Or is it just coming from the angelica somehow? Or does the angelica work to 
increase the citrus extraction in the process? It's just something to think about. I don't actually have an answer for what's right or wrong here. I'm just really interested and I, it's good to get you guys thinking about it. Um, so we were talking about volatility, while you're tasting those, we were talking about volatilities and I said that potentially there could be another effect going on here, that there could be something that was not related to volatility that these fixtures were having an effect on. I've done a lot of scouring, and when I say I, I emailed my old mate at uni and he's looked through all the journals for me, um, to find out whether the, there is a fixative effect from the point of view of an antioxidant effect. So there was this suggestion that there are compounds in a fixative that are almost like sacrificial compounds, that they oxidize in preference to some of the more delicate compounds like limonene. Now, I haven't found any concrete evidence of that. And one, one of the experiments that I wanted to carry out was some kind of analysis to try and see if I could see the byproducts of, an, of oxidation in samples that were stressed in a certain way. I have made up samples three to six on the board. And these were actually for the GCMS analyses that I was hoping to do. I have, and here you can see the font screwing up. <laughs> Um, I have made them up. So this, this sample three is dry to recipe, the Bermondsey dry to recipe. Sample four is the Bermondsey dry without angelica root. Sample five is Bermondsey dry without orris root. And sample six is without either. Okay. What I was hoping to do on these was run them down a GCMS on new samples and aged samples and get a qualitative and quantitative analysis of what was happening in the presence and absence of these fixatives. And I really hope if there's someone in the audience or someone who I've spoken to on the phone and asked if they'll help me with this, oh, um, will, who has a GCMS and will carry out those experiments and most importantly publish the results openly because I think these, this idea could be quite interesting to the gin industry as a whole. Um, so if you want to sample them, taste them, have a little bit of a think, I'd appreciate any feedback. And again, um, don't judge them as balanced gins. I've just dropped the fixative away. That's all I've done. And they were made up about six weeks ago as well. Is anyone tasting a difference that they could put down to a fixative? Yeah? With the Oris? Okay. So that's sample five. And that's being the Oris in there, you mean? Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Six is tasting quite neutral. Okay. Okay. So it's definitely having some kind of effect on the overall flavour of the gin. Well, let's move on. Like, just have a think about that. I'd appreciate any feedback at the end or any input from that. It was just a really, um, it's not a very analytical or very tangible result, but I think it's just something that's really interesting to have a, have a play around with. Um, we've discussed a little bit about how they might work, which you may or may not remember, but um, the uh, interesting question, obviously, is what botanicals are acting as fixatives? As I said, there's a vast amount of information out there from the perfume industry. If you look online, there are websites upon websites explaining to people how to make a natural perfume, how to build up a perfume recipe that is essentially a blend of essential oils that have been categorized according to their evaporation rate. And they're talking about top, middle and base notes here. So according to, okay, it just fits on good. Um, according to the, uh, perfume industry, these are the top notes and these are the middle notes that you're looking at. And I don't think it was of any surprise that citrus and juniper have been included in the top notes that are available to you. When they start talking about base notes and what base notes you want in your perfume, they really highlight the fact that you want as many of your base notes as possible to also have fixative properties. In fact, they start talking about it as a percentage of the overall essential oil content of your perfume before you can see a noticeable effect. They're talking in the region about 15% of the overall essential oil content of your perfume has to be a fixative if you want it to work. Um, 
And I think when we talk in the gin industry, we talk about Angelica and Oris. I don't know of anyone else who talks about any other compounds that have this fixed of effect. In the perfume industry, there's many, many more. <laughs> and it's actually quite difficult to get a comprehensive list of them. I did troll several perfume sites and you can just get them. I think Ilang Ilang's fallen off the bottom, but essentially they're all there. Um, now, they not only talk about fixatives in terms of um, the percentage of overall essential oil content, but also they talk about two types of fixatives. So one that you would only use just solely for its fixative properties, and one that you, you would use that imparts aroma and character onto the perfume, as well as having fixative properties. So there's the two that they very definitely specify the difference between. And a lot of the fixatives they talk about that impart this aroma and character also can be included in top note and middle note lists that you find online. So that's quite interesting, I thought. On this list, you have the traditional Angelica Auris. You also, I've put some uh, perfume fixtures on here that aren't botanicals. So some that come are from animal origins. So my favorite is, oh, it's dropped on. So that should read Hyroceum. Um, so Hyroceum is one of the oldest and rarest uh, perfume fixes to get hold of. It's described as the rock-like petrified excrement, including both urine and feces of the South African rock badger. Now, ant gin eat your heart out. That's what I want to put in my gin, okay? I'm, I'm getting to hold of some of this. Um, they, I've also included galbanum and labdanum. They're on the list, but they're described as gum resin, so I'm not actually sure that they're being used in perfume as an aromatic distillate. It might actually just be that they're a physical barrier to hold the aromas against the skin, so they're blended with the oils, so that when it hits your skin, you've got like this physical coating of the perfume. But I think the most interesting thing for me about this list was the inclusion of coriander seed, cassia, nutmeg, um, I think rosemary was on here, can't find it at the minute. Rosemary, uh, several very commonly used gin botanicals that we don't talk about as fixatives. And when I started this, looking into this talk and thinking about this research, I really wanted to try and understand how many gins were there on the market that didn't have a fixative in them. So I was thinking about Angelica and Oris, and David Smith very kindly gave me his botanical matrix. If your gin isn't on it, it should be. It's a really, really useful resource. Um, and I went through this botanical matrix, and this is a few of an example of few, a few of the gins that um, came up as not having Angelica or Oris on them. However, when you run this list past this new perfume fixative list, most of them disappear, apart from one that had a mystery botanical in and the single botanical gins that are on there. So I'm not actually sure how many gins are out on the market that don't have at least one of these base perfume fixative botanicals in them. If you look back at the history of gin recipes, the oldest gin recipe that we know of, which is the Gin 1495, contains significant amounts of nutmeg which was listed on the list. Um, similarly, if you know anything about our spiel from Jensen's, that uh, our Jensen's Old Tom recipe came from a distiller's handbook from the 19th century. There are a lot of gin recipes in there, but there is not a single one that doesn't include coriander, cassia. They all include either nutmeg, musk, oris, angelica. So really, they all have, from, I think it starts in about 1820, a gin fixative in there. Let's come back to this hit or myth. I don't think anyone is questioning that there is a noticeable botanical fixative effect in the perfume industry and that is recognized and accepted. But I really feel that there is a lot more to be asked when we think about fixatives in terms of the gin industry. These fixatives are large non-volatile molecules. Are they volatile enough to come across in the distillation? So are they even present? Because it's not just the botanical, it's the actual chemical compound. Are they present in our gins? And if they are present in our gins, in what concentration are they there? Are they there in a concentration that actually has an effect, is actually there powerful enough to affect a, a change over time? And for me personally, I went from thinking about does Angelica and Oris act, do Angelica and Oris act as a fixative and um, how many gins are there out there that don't have a fixative in them? And started to think more, how many gin distillers out there use these botanicals purely for their fixative effects, okay? 
if we look at it in terms of comparison to the perfume industry, is it that we as gin distillers don't talk about coriander seed as a fixative because we use it as a citrus and spice note and the fixative effect is just a bonus that we don't really think about. And over time that story has been lost because it's really not that important. So I know there's a lot more analytical work here to be done and it's still an interesting subject to me, but I hope I've given you kind of an idea of what might be happening on a molecular level and also more importantly what botanicals you could be thinking of in terms of a fixative. Thank you.